I feel like I've been vindicated or validated. Huh? Validated. <laughs> That's what. That's it. You're like a parking ticket. <laughs> <laughs> You're listening to the Help Me With HIPAA podcast, where HIPAA and humor collide to make learning fun. Your delightful hosts are Donna Grindle and David Sims. Relax, HIPAA help is on the way. Welcome to episode 415 of the Help Me With HIPAA podcast. My name is David Sims of HIPAA for MSPs, and joining me is Donna Grindle of Carden. What's happening, Donna? Oh, you know, this and that and the other. (laughs) So as we're recording this, it's July 3rd. One day away from the big explosions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, instead of doing what everybody did, you know, get a long weekend in, we decided we were going to do projects at home. I'm exhausted. Yeah. Yeah. I got a staycation coming up next week. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. not a vacation, is it? Uh, no, it's it's a workcation. <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's I, I have to get away from everything else to get caught up on work stuff. Yeah. Yep. Th- that's our vacation. <laughs> I totally get it. I'm going to run away soon myself. Yeah. So um, anyway, we should be able to make it through this since it's during the day. Won't be hearing a lot of explosions, hopefully. I don't know about you, but around here you can shoot fireworks and it is very noisy mm-hmm. at night. <laughs> what do your dogs think about that? They are one of them. I'd say two of them are okay with it. One of them's petrified. Which one's petrified? Uh, Veda. Uh, so one of the yeah. puppies. Yeah, one of the puppies. She does not like them. So wow. I don't think the other two are very fond of it, but, you know, Veda's like crawl up in your lap and start shaking. <laughs> Bless their hearts. Yeah. Yeah. We had a big thunderstorm here last week, and they were they were all running around like, "What's going on?" <laughs> <laughs> I know. I always feel sorry for them because they're, you know, bless their hearts. They're like, "This is not what a, a, a inside dog deals with." I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever's going on outside is not normal. Mm-hmm. Why are you not panicking? <laughs> 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 You should panic yeah. more. I know. What is wrong with you? You are not panicking. So, uh, yeah. But anyway, we're going to get through this one and uh, talk about some pretty cool stuff. We have a very interesting enforcement action to discuss mm-hmm. and prove some people wrong who have argued with Donna in the past. <laughs> I just not wait. That. I just wait because it'll come. <laughs> yep. A couple of mic drops there. And uh, they want to cover a publication that came out recently talking about, you know, some other things you should be worried about (laughs) is if you don't have enough. (laughs) Awareness. It's half the battle. I know. It's, but it's the hardest part because the more you talk about it, it's some people hit that thing where they're like, we just, we can't win. So let's just stop. (laughs) 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 And, And then you got others who are like, I just don't want to hear anymore. I'll just put my head in the sand. I'm just not worrying about it. So mm-hmm. it's, it's a, it's a challenge. Uh, I had a conversation last week. I was interviewed for Medscape magazine. It's like an online magazine. So, mm-hmm. and they were talking about the, the recent thing we talked about with the security guards, you know, having access to PHI and, uh, and I'm, and I mentioned the podcast and all that. So hopefully we'll get a shout out in their article. Mm-hmm. But uh, we talked about how people oftentimes just get overloaded with all the information, whether it's notifications or alerts or things that we're putting out. And you do wonder at some point if it's um, it's just getting to the point where people just don't want to pay attention anymore. Mm-hmm. Like, How many times do you hear about data breaches and people are like, oh, yeah, well, it's going to happen. Whereas a few years ago, it's like, oh, my God. Major data breach. <laughs> you know, there's, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. It just, you get breach fatigue. Well, yeah, so. it's a, it's a real problem, but it's kind of like on the flip side of, you know, to me, I use Waze, the app, mm-hmm. even when I know where I'm going in Atlanta. Yeah, I do too. Because it's going to tell me about things. That you also know happen in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. Traffic jams, accidents, 
road closures. Hey, just recently, SUV driving down Ponce and a hole opened up and it went down in it. <laughs> and I was like on that same stretch of road like two weeks before. And I'm like, woo, glad it wasn't mine. But these kind of things, you just never know. And it alerts you all the time to what's going on ahead and, you know, recalculates, gives you new directions and stuff because I know it's going to happen. So I just accept that it's going to happen. Mm-hmm. And I learned long ago, don't argue with it when it's <laughs> telling me things are going to happen. I should take, you know, proactive measures. So one time it kept telling me, get off here, get off here. And I'm like, why would I get off here? You know, and it would never tell me that. It's like, get off of this exit. And I'm like, I'm not getting off here. Get off the next exit. I'm not getting off here. Finally, I went, wait a minute. I should pay attention. Mm -hmm. And had I not gotten off at the next exit, I would have spent two and a half hours in traffic. Because I would have no way out. See, so you do have to listen even when it's nagging you. That's all I'm going to say. Or you could just keep driving and say, well, eventually I'm sure I'll just fall into some kind of pothole in the road. <laughs> <laughs> these things happen. <laughs> yeah. You know, well, most people do those. They say these things happen to other people right. until it happens right. to them. Right. Can you imagine those mm. poor people? They were fine, though. They just had to work to get out of the vehicle. They had to climb over and come out in the back seats because the front doors were in the hole. Yeah. That's uh-uh. crazy. <laughs> I've seen those videos online where that happens where like a parking lot just opens up and swallows all the cars. Yeah, we had that happen <laughs> like, here in Tucker that it almost got a building. It's like ah. it stopped like a foot from the building. But needless to say, they were no longer accepting customers because the parking lot was now a hole. <laughs> That's crazy. Well, yeah. my house, my house is built on a vein of granite that runs from somewhere in the top part of South Carolina all the way down like Thorpe to uh, Columbia. Mm-hmm. So I think I'm good. Yeah. Until the earthquake <laughs> comes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Until the earthquake comes. Yeah. It's, it's funny. We had a, years ago, we had a disagreement, which we'll, so we'll say with um, the local water and sewer company who said that they needed to go through the back of our property to put uh, a line in. And they were going to, you know, you basically, you either let us do this or we're going to take it from you. <laughs> okay. And, Go ahead. And so yeah, and so there was uh there was some fighting going on back and forth and eventually we had to come to an agreement and when I say we, I mean m- my parents. I was not in part of this fight, but so they they finally had to agree to to do some things. Well, long story short, the water company comes in to put their line in and again, it's on a slab of granite, which apparently they didn't realize. <laughs> And, and so <laughs> nobody looked tore, into dirt first. They tore up. I couldn't tell you how many machines and bits and I don't know, just tore stuff up all over the place, trying to get into that, you know, through that granite to run their, their pipes and stuff. So I bet you they were saying this was a much more expensive <laughs> proposition and we should have just went around this property. <laughs> <laughs> but it's funny because you can go back to the back of my property and you can see chunks of, of granite that's got the bore holes drilled in it where they had to slide the dynamite down in there and try to blow it up. <laughs> oh, my God. Well, you know, I live by the largest exposed piece of granite in the world. You do? Yeah. Matter of fact, maybe that's where it ends up at. Maybe I'm on that piece of granite. <laughs> oh, that explains the connection. Yeah. Okay, now I'm weirded out. We should get on to HIPAA. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. Well, let's dive into our newest segment, HIPAA Briefs. Go ahead, Donna. What you got in your briefs today? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, today our quick HIPAA brief is to remind people that HIPAA privacy, security, and breach rules do apply to business associates. It's not just the the number of times, you know, you hear and you are told, oh, BAs don't have to worry about these. They only have to worry about the security rule. What do we say to that, David? Wrong. (laughs) (laughs) 
Yes, and we're about to, uh, you know, get to say that yet again. But the whole thing is if you don't have the portions of the privacy rule that identify what PHI is and what you're allowed to do with it, then the security rule doesn't know what to do with what to do. It doesn't know what to protect. It doesn't know what to do with it. So clearly you've got to have uh, the uh, definition of approved uses and disclosures and minimum necessary. Those are required. And when you try to convince people of that, huh, <laughs> it gets complicated, but they're wrong. And then the number of times where we'll ask a business associate, what are your plans for the breach notification requirements? And they like literally will say, not our problem. That's the responsibility of our clients. Wrong. <laughs> you need to know so many other things. So if you're a business associate and you have taken advice that says you only need to worry about the security rule and nothing in privacy and nothing in breach notification, you should revisit that. So there's your breach. That's it. Oh, brief, not breach. <laughs> Look at this. I got too many things in my head. There's your HIPAA brief. Um, All right. <laughs> very good. Very good. All right. So we're going to spend the rest of the time proving what you just said. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we're going to move on into the HIPAA Say What segment. And we're talking about a resolution agreement and a corrective action plan. Mm -hmm. And uh, also talk a little bit about the disclosures of um, an unsecured server, which costs a lot of money. Yeah, that, that is expensive. So a new resolution agreement came out. Boom. It's a, a BA, not a CE. Say it ain't so. Not a CE at all. It's a company iHealth Solutions LLC, DBA at Vantum Health are doing business as. So they changed their name, and that's an interesting time scale thing as well. It's a Kentucky-based business associate that provides coding, billing, and according. Now, this is in the OCR announcement, on-site IT services to healthcare providers. Now, what that means to me and you doesn't seem to be what they were doing. Yeah. That the whole term IT services yes. has it, it's taken on a completely different meaning these days. Yes. I, and I run into this all the time where somebody's like, you know, we're we're doing IT and I and I'm looking at what they're doing. And I'm like, this is not IT. I don't know what you're doing. Well, it's <laughs> it's in the definition of information technology. Mm -hmm. So for so long, information technology meant specializing and managing the networks and stuff. But now information technology, because the applications are, they're integrated and you've got legacy to deal with and all of these different scenarios, you can be an IT service provider that focuses on the applications and how to, you not like the you know, you click here when this happens. Not that, but actually the configuration and management of those applications. So I've even I've even seen folks that they're doing print management and they're their IT services. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you're just making sure the printers work. <laughs> 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 yeah, well, you know how complicated that is? Remember, the reason Nowadays, I quit <laughs> the reason I quit IT is because I, I didn't care if you could print. So yeah. uh, but the point is that they they list them that way. And so immediately you know, and I believe one thing, and then we learn, you know, we you, David, we have to keep reading, and guess what we do? We keep reading. Yes. But Often now when we've had these BA settlements, it's been that somewhere along the way, the BA was actually owned by the CEs and providing management services. And I've seen that configuration many times. Mm -hmm. But this is an independent business associate. 
at least from, you know, doesn't seem to be involved with ownership by any other health system or any of those kind of things. So I went to their website to understand what they do because I really wanted to understand that IT services piece. And uh, and I'll put this on the web page and I guess I should make sure I have a link to their website. But they were founded in 2013. And That's then, an interesting year. Yeah, I know, right? And then they, it goes on to say they rebranded to Advantum Health in 2017 because they had grown both, both organically and through strategic acquisition of Paradigm Health, DNA Healthcare, All Documents, and Empower Docs. So, not really sure as the timing to everything, but rebranding in 2017, I get that. And especially when you've gotten all of these different entities together, they say that we today we offer a one-stop shop for all your revenue cycle services to physicians, hospitals, and health systems supported by over 650 employees around the world. Sounds awesome. And so a question, and I'm sure you'll get to this, but <laughs> was the breach before or after all these acquisitions? Not clear, and I didn't bother doing the research. I'm sure, you know, a couple of Googles uh, to find the exact dates of yeah. the acquisitions, but we're both going to guess that if they rebranded in 2017, those acquisitions were either taking place or had taken place, which meant... You had to fight your way through putting all of that stuff together. And mm -hmm. I, I've been there where you you got to go figure out how to integrate in these M&A scenarios. And, and that was before it was as complicated as today. And it was so complicated, it was just, I'm like, yeah, I, I really want a different job now. Because... There's just so much you have to worry about. And uh, and I, I didn't hate doing it, but the stress of doing it is intense. So anything in there that doesn't describe IT services like we do, and there's no listing for on-site IT services, but they do mention consulting on things like optimizing your EHR. That would be the thing that I referenced that fell under being an expert in management of these applications. So I, I'm going to go with maybe that's what they were talking about. So that's point number one is it's a BA, not a CE. Doesn't seem to have any tie to a CE whatsoever. Then the uh, things comes out on the announcement which it specifically says that the settlement relates to quote potential violations of both the privacy and security rule so <laughs> you know, i'm not saying i'm just saying you can't violate it if it doesn't apply to you <laughs> right so we're gonna go with that potential and remember now the settlements all say potential violations if it is a civil money penalty, it is due to the violations. What you're doing is saying, don't worry about telling anybody I actually had violations. Just let's agree that I'm going to put a stake in the ground and move forward. Mm -hmm. So that being said, the third thing I noticed that we should learn from this one is you know, most of the time everybody's like, oh, well, this uh, investigation came up because there was a breach of over 500 patients. Well, this was only 267 patients. Mm -hmm. And when this breach notification came through, guess what? They what said, hey, we're going to look into this, which I'm sure was a bit of a surprise. Darn it. Darn it. <laughs> <laughs> It was probably a surprise. I know it'd be like, okay, you know, and I've helped people in these kind of situations where we do make it and you, you feel pretty confident that you're going to fall under the radar, but this one did not. 
Because what probably got their attention is it happened because a single network server was exposed to the internet without security to protect it. Ouch. Mm -hmm. That sucks. And it wasn't like a big one. It wasn't like somebody made a big mistake in a conversion because it was just that one server and it only had 267 patients on it. So what is going on? That's what makes me think that it was part of an acquisition. Yeah, me too. And I, I mean, like, it, it seems as though it was just part of integration. And, you know, to me, it sounds like, and well, it, it there are things that indicate to me that it had to do with upgrading a server and probably something where this tortures me more than anything else. It's only used internally. We don't have to worry about securing it. Mm. I just, I, I actually stop breathing a little bit when I hear that. Someday I'm just going to pass out. And then when I come to, I'll go, does that show you how stupid that is? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, but we do have our OCR director quote, which is the thing that, you know, they want us to see when they do these settlements. So, hit it, Mr. Sims. Don't enough. HIPAA business associates must protect the privacy and security of the health information they are entrusted with by HIPAA-covered entities. Effective cybersecurity includes ensuring that EPHI is secure and not accessible to just anyone with an internet connection. Which is what here. happened here. <laughs> yep. Show sure enough. So they reported the breach and OCR launched the investigation in August 2017. They reported the breach in May or they discovered it in May. It doesn't look like one of those weird ones where you know the 60 days are out you know it looks like they did what they were supposed to do as far as once the problem had occurred mm -hmm. and your hair's on fire and panic sets in which you know I watched it happen right in front of my eyes sometimes participated in the panic because like <laughs> wait what so the resolution agreement Makes it sure, you know, all of the usual suspects, you, we, you violated the privacy rule because you allowed unauthorized access to PHI. And the security rule, guess what the thing they didn't do under the security rule? I, I could never actually guess. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Yeah, I said that. Can we just say that they didn't do the SRA? Is I mean, because that's the bottom line. <laughs> they didn't do the SRA. So they didn't have a big one. And they clearly didn't do what, you know, we've, we've had to call. Now, does everybody call this? No. It's what we teach people because it's, it makes for an easier conversation. Is the security risk analysis the big thing where you need to do all a complete and thorough everything you have? And you should stay on top of that. And when there are changes, you need to make sure it's incorporated in that risk analysis. Yeah, but so every single one of these MAs. <laughs> yeah. It should have had one. And that's also mentioned in here, by the by, is we say do a mini one, and when we say mini one, we're saying you focus on one project, what it impacts, and how it fits into your overall risk management. And then the next time you're doing a big one, now that one's part of it. But first, I've got to get this bitty piece, this new piece or change into the system. So we call it a mini so that people don't freak out when we say we need to do an SRA. We're not saying just to add a server, you need to redo the entire process that took weeks. You know, we want to evaluate everything that's in those findings, how it would be impacted, what we need to worry about here, and how do we integrate that back into our risk management plan. They didn't do that. It's pretty clear. And, you know, and, and these folks seem 
I mean, it's not like the we don't care folks that you see often. It it's you know, we we kind of thought we knew what we were doing, but things were moving so fast, they didn't keep up with what they were doing. They didn't have what we encourage, which is privacy and security by design. And if you can reach the point where every meeting about changing workflow, policies, procedures, expansion, contraction, new services, anything, any project that you are discussing at some point on the agenda, every meeting, until you determine you don't need it, is will this impact privacy and security in some way? And when you do that, then you don't forget it. You don't overlook it. And that's the big difference is that should be in every meeting, every discussion, will this impact privacy and security? That didn't happen. And with M&As, well, I mean, you just look, remember, what was it when uh, Yahoo was being bought? How many different data breaches did they find in the due diligence? Yeah, I don't remember, but it was a lot. <laughs> It's like every time you looked at the news, there was another problem that they found and the value of the company kept dropping. <laughs> yeah, I know. You would think if somebody's buying out another company, I would certainly do that because you could get a better deal on it, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, the chances of you finding a problem on these companies that aren't run very well, at least in the compliance aspect, <laughs> you can get you a bargain. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's, you know, that was a whole big piece. We did a whole discussion at the uh, boot camp on what kind of questions you should be asking in M&As. Mm -hmm. You know, if you are looking to merge or acquire, you need to know privacy and security world you're getting into. Yep. You could be inheriting a big old problem. Yeah. You could welcome in a smelly turd. <laughs> is that is that acronym <laughs> <laughs> welcome in a smelly turd there you go uh, <laughs> t-u-r-d <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll come up with something <laughs> <laughs> yeah let's see technology used with uh, while Remote risk, desktop. <laughs> risk diversion. What? There you go. <laughs> I said something with remote desktop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Those are another problem. So yeah. anyway, they, they, you know, I'm going to assume it was somebody somewhere in one of these companies had a small app that they had used and they did the approach of, we don't have to worry about high level security because Quote, we only use it internally. I'm almost, you know, you, you, it, it's some obscure thing and they're like, oh, that's on, on an old server. We're just going to move everything over. You got to look. You got to look what's on it. And I'm sure these people have learned that now. Bless their hearts. But <laughs> it's, it's one of those things that you want to learn from this. I'm sure they did. And you should learn from it, too, is just because there's something old sitting there and it's a little bitty app, doesn't have much in it, you don't worry about it, that is the pitfall. So when it was then exposed, it's just a matter. I mean, you're lucky if you get days before somebody finds it and pulls the date off of it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it can be... It just depends on what's exposed before you determine how long it takes them to find it and pull data off of it. Yeah. And I often see that with older systems that are quote unquote still in use. Mm -hmm. And somebody says, well, we don't, we don't need to manage that one. We don't need to protect that. One. We don't use it anymore. I'm like, why is it connected? Why is it on? Well, every so often we have to pull data off of it. Okay. Um, uh -huh. and then it needs to be protected. Or even, and I've had somebody say this, what if, what if we just turn it on when we need to use it? Well, how, how long does it take you to, to turn it on and, and use it? I mean, we'll probably have it on for maybe two or three hours. I'm like, no. no. Do you know how quickly this could be found when you turn it on? Like minutes. Yeah. 
That's why, I mean, we the number of times we've helped people figure out, find a tiny little closet that you can put a lock on that gets enough air circulation that you can put that single device in there that's not connected to anything at all. It doesn't have mm-hmm. Wi-Fi. It doesn't have Internet. You don't even have an Ethernet connection on it. And the only thing you can use is a pre-approved USB stick that you can take in that only certain people know how to get into the room and log into the device and save to that stick whenever you want off it. And then they lock it back up and shut it down. That mm-hmm. would be the way to handle it. Yeah. and then But the problem with that is some other guy comes along and says, why are you doing this? This is ridiculous. Just hook it to the network. Yeah. And they are the <laughs> ones that are wrong. <laughs> I know. So they stroke a check for $75,000. It's not a ton, but it's still a lot to a small business. Even with 650 employees, they're, they're not a, a giant business. They're not a micro business like we are, but they're not a giant business. That mm-hmm. hurts. And hopefully their insurance pays for it. It may also speak to how well they were doing in other areas. So we don't right. know. Yeah. And how quickly they responded. Because often what you do in that first 30 days afterwards is a huge difference. So yeah. it could speak Throw to Throw yourself a lot of to the mercy. <laughs> <laughs> but it it is, you know, it has, I was glad to see, you know, the SRA and all that stuff. That stuff's in there, but the minimum content of the policies and procedures section didn't just say the security rule, because we expect Mm -hmm. to see, you know, it mentioned the privacy rule and the breach notification rule. So there's our mic drop. For all of those who have told us over the years, we are wrong. Yeah. The, Still have that conversation. Uh huh. Here it is from HHS OCR. This is what we expect to see for a business associate: the minimum. Not what mm-hmm. this is the bare minimum, and it included policies and procedures related to acceptable uses and disclosures, minimum necessary. And notification by a BA, including all required and addressable specs in 164.410, that, my friends, is the breach notification rule. And for those of you who don't suffer through the boot camps or you forgot what you learned, 164.500 is the privacy rule, 400 is breach notification, and 300 is the security rule. So, there you go. You need to have a policy and procedure to deal with all of these. So, when we (laughs) sell our policy and procedure thing to um, BAs and we're like, here's your privacy rule policies, and they're like, we don't need those. (laughs) And they know, I say. Um, the SRA language is the new language that we're used to seeing. They didn't change that because it was a BA. Go figure. It's not mm-hmm. different. That's right. And it makes a point of saying a complete inventory of all of their facilities, categories of electronic equipment, information systems, devices, and media, and applications that contain or store EPHI, which will then be incorporated into their risk analysis. Go figure. Oh, wait a minute. So they got to do a risk analysis too? Yeah. <laughs> I know. Do they have to do a risk management plan too? Yeah. <laughs> it required a risk analysis, a risk management plan, and policies and procedures, David. No. I say it ain't so. So under mm-hmm. the minimum security rule provisions, we normally expect to see the safeguards, you know our standard safeguards, administrative, physical, and technical. Everybody knows they're there, right? Mm -hmm. But they didn't stop there, David. Can you believe there's more that they should worry about under the security rule? Like what? It says specifically 
that they should have policies and procedures and documentation requirements addressed in a policy and procedure. Mm. <laughs> policy and procedure about policy and procedure. <laughs> People again look at us like we're crazy. Boom, another mic drop. It is in writing multiple things in that one settlement. So all of you business associates out there and everybody that has a business associate, go get that and ask your business associate, do, do they address all of these? That's a whole new way. I want you to go to this resolution agreement, to this section of what you're supposed to be doing, and are you doing these things? Done. It's not me asking. It's me showing you what you're going to need to have. So there you have it. I'm very enlightened. No, I'm very, uh, what is the term, David? I feel like I've been vindicated. or Validated. Huh? Validated. <laughs> That's what. That's it. You're like a parking ticket. <laughs> uh, that's a good one uh, so there is the detail of what our breach brief <laughs> that's why it's a breach brief because it's a brief about what we learned in in, in documented from a breach no. Okay. Just making that up as I go. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> Told you I was exhausted. <laughs> uh, all right. So you then reviewed the other piece that we were going to cover today. Yeah. So uh, to wrap it up today, we are going to talk about a notification that came out from Asper. For those of you who don't remember our podcast on that, it is the Administration for Strategic preparedness and response. And they came out you know, June 16th with a notification specifically for healthcare and public health se sector, which you and I both know, rut row. <laughs> so um, I'll, I'll make it short. It's, it's nine pages and some of it's kind of technical uh, and we'll have a link to it in the show notes. But basically they want to let you know that there is another hacker team out there it's called Timishwara Hacker Team. Where did you, you figure gotta, out that comes from, Timishwara? Uh, it comes from Romania. So it's a city in Romania. Uh, huh. The thing they don't know on that is, is it Romanians? Or are they trying to make people think they're from Romania? They don't know. Uh -huh. There's a lot of we don't knows about who's doing it. In fact, they say, we don't really know anything about this group. Other than they do act similar to some other groups like Deep Blue Magic. And potentially they're an offshoot of that group. We don't know. But we do know that, number one, they're using very rarely used and very effective techniques for encrypting data. And we do know that they are targeting specifically healthcare. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's bad for a number of reasons. One. Being specifically targeted is not good ever. And, and two, uh, couple that with rarely used and very effective. <laughs> and, and little known about. Yeah. And, and one of the reasons why they're, they're doing this is because most of the time, it's how ineffective that healthcare is at protecting themselves and how valuable their data is and how often they pay. So it is purely a monetary play here. Uh, a lot of hacker groups have this unwritten moral code that they won't attack healthcare. They won't attack anything that could physically harm somebody. But this is one of those groups who don't care. They don't care about it. They want and the so, money. Yeah, they want the money. Uh, it says that researchers did discover this group in 2018, July of 2018, as a matter of fact. And it's still, and this has been, what, five years ago? Yeah. They discovered them five years ago, and still there's relatively little known about them. Wow. Um, the, the other thing that's interesting is that they, uh, they use encryption tools that we would use. 
they use Microsoft BitLocker. There's another one they use called Jetico's Best Crypt, which is something you just go buy. So these are uh, these are legitimate encryption tools. Not ones they so, write themselves, like a right. Lot of they're not right. Yeah, they're not writing their own stuff. They're just using stuff that you would use anyway. And matter of fact, BitLocker is on every single version of Windows Professional. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so for all you who think that potentially your uh, your antivirus, anti malware might catch this. I mean, it's it's a it's a tool that's already there, or it's a tool that's could be there. Uh, the other thing about it too, though, is it said that oftentimes what it does is it goes in and stops all the running services on a machine first. Well, oh. what would a running service be, David? I'm glad you asked, <laughs> because a running service would be all the security tools that you have. <laughs> <laughs> the other interesting part is, and I, this is what I like to see is, you know, first of all, what are the symptoms? You should know by now that a, any ransomware symptoms typically is one, you're going to have your stuff encrypted. And number two, they're going to tell you about it. <laughs> they're going to be like, hey, well, we were visiting your machine and decided to lock your files and we would love for you to pay to get them unlocked. So you'll see some type of ransomware note. Uh, the ransomware note they use is very similar to the one used by another group. Again, th- that's why they think it might be an offshoot of that group. But the distribution method is what I'm always interested in. How is it happening? And as you would su- you know, suspect, it's happening through spam emails and email attachments. So there hmm. you go. For those of you who do not have very good email protection, you are missing out. And I know a lot of folks, they have endpoint protection, they've got network protection, they've got all this stuff. And then when you say, what about email protection? Well, I've got all these other tools that's protecting me. Mm-hmm. Um, you should have very strong, since most of these things come through email, you should have very strong email protection. If you can prevent it from happening, you don't have to worry about the fact that they're using BitLocker and the fact that it could turn off your services and your security and all that because your email security will will catch it and stop it. So if you don't have it, go get it. If you don't know who to get it from, call me. <laughs> 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 it is worth saying that uh, in 2021, there was an attack against a French hospital that was loosely attributed to this group. And uh, matter of fact, they called the group THT for short. Mm. And it did just completely wreak havoc on this uh, healthcare mm. system. You know, they couldn't, they couldn't see patients. It uh, significantly reduced the treatment capability. It rendered digital services unavailable. It also threatened to expose the PHI of, of people. And oh, by the way, when you read this, they use the acronym PHI to mean personal health information. So for all you HHS folks listening, Protected health information. You're killing me here. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Please don't do that. You're killing me. We, you know, as much as I'm trying to get people to use the right acronym, even some of the publications are wrong Mm -hmm. coming out of HHS. So, but this is just really to point out that not all people who understand certain aspects of cybersecurity understand the aspects of HIPAA. <laughs> and not all people that understand the aspects of cybersecurity and healthcare understand right. HIPAA. Exactly. We so yeah. we we see the misused verbiage of PHI often, and here we are again, unfortunately. And, and mm-hmm. <laughs> somebody somewhere will argue with me someday to say PHI stands for personal health information, and they'll point to this document as a proof. <laughs> yeah, well, we'll point to this episode to prove that we knew then it was wrong. I know, I know. Come on, people. You Come have one on, job. Man. <laughs> we need to have As Krista would say, as Krista would say, you had one job. <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyway, that that's pretty much it. The rest of it, you know, go read. You can see what the ransomware note looks like on your screen. And, and as you would imagine, it's basically like, hey, we're honest criminals and we don't lie. And, and we run a successful business in multiple countries. And so therefore you should pay us. And it's here's the payment information and all this kind of stuff. It, just know this stuff is this stuff is bad. It's not going away. Mm-hmm. 
and it keeps changing all the time and, and it'll be a different ransomware game tomorrow if it's not this one and there there's always problems and, well, and this notice is prompted not now you mentioned the french hospital attack but they have attacked in june and all we know, all they're saying is a U.S. cancer center. Yep, that's right. Forgot to bring that one up. It reduced patient treatment capabilities, the unavailability of digital services, and the health IT security article fixes it, the possibility of exposed patient-protected health information. Mm. But I did notice one of the things that they make a point of is they are encrypting with a strong encryption algorithm because they're using commercial stuff. Mm -hmm. And for everybody, please take advantage of, they are taking advantage of poorly protected remote desktop access. And they utilize various exploits to gain remote access to the network. Most commonly, They'll go through the CVE list, which is the Common Vulnerability Exploitations list. Things that we found and we know people are using so that you can make sure you don't have them. Well, they use them too to go find vulnerable VPNs. Mm -hmm. So again, if I think I have a VPN to my remote desktop, even then, you need to have that 2FA on there. So please... And they 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 go out and they find their zero days, and then they do the what do they call a uh, they go and they they use whatever they can find. They're like the people <laughs> on a loan. <laughs> yeah. Well, the last part of this at the bottom it says that they they do utilize tools what what they call living off the land. In other words, they're using tools that are already there, uh, which which means they're less likely to be de detected by security solutions. And the specific VPN they mention is 40 OS SSL VPN, which is probably by what 40 gate or Fortinet. Uh, one of those Fortinet, one of those companies. So well, I guess Fortinet makes Fortigate, but anyway, so a very common company used in business, very common uh, VPN. Uh, and they use the RDP. So remote desktop protocol is utilized to move laterally throughout the network laterally. So again, as Donna mentioned earlier, oh, just because it's not internet facing, if if you get in and then you've got remote desktop protocol open all over the place on the inside, then you're good. You're golden. You can go anywhere you want to go at that point. Yeah, and that's that's the thing that I just cannot get people to I mean, I had to have a whole conversation with somebody to say, look, you need to go back to your IT provider. Because we made a list of things that were vulnerable on your internal network, and their answer was, this is only internal. We don't worry about it. Mm -hmm. I poked my eyes out. I put them back in. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's complicated, but um, there's just too many things. You know, there's multiple things that have just come out. I mean, we don't even have time to cover all of the announcements that are coming out of AC3 and CISA related to problems that yeah. are being noted now. And we always tell you the holiday, the summertime, mm -hmm. you can lose your entire fun summer. <laughs> yeah, because I'll guarantee you over this past weekend, somebody was having fun. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll hear about it in a few more months but yeah, yeah. it'll have happened over july 4th weekend it, it could be right now people are panicking if not now yeah. somebody somewhere in the healthcare world you know probably mm -hmm. either you listen to us or you know somebody that listens to us and there's going to be panic today or wednesday after the holiday yeah, or next Monday, because I know some yeah, folks yeah. took our entire week off. That's <laughs> right, and I've seen them hit the weekend they infect when everybody's gone and then hit the weekend after. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll be looking for it. Don't worry. Dum, da dum, dum. <laughs> All right, folks, that is our show for today. Thanks for listening. Uh, be sure to share it out and give us a review. We appreciate those things. 
For Donna and myself, remember, HIPAA is not about compliance. It's about patient care. You've been listening to the Help Me With HIPAA podcast, hosted by Donna Grendel and David Sims. The show created to help you with HIPAA. For more information or to ask us a question, visit our website at helpmewithhipaa.com. Neither Donna Grendel or David Sims are attorneys, and they do not offer binding legal advice concerning regulatory compliance. The information in this podcast should not be relied upon or construed as legal advice in any way. Consult your attorney for legal advice concerning compliance with HIPAA regulations.